Uh, good morning, everyone. I wasn't very enthusiastic. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, today is the uh, first in a series of uh, leadership forums we are developing for all of you. The forums are designed to stress the value of what we do every single day, public service. I am extremely proud of each and every one of you, the, de de the dedicated and hardworking staff of the City of Portland. Each of you contribute to making Portland the great city that it is today. There are many times, though, when being a public servant can seem thankless or undervalued. And that, is, and that is why I think it is important to take just a few moments of our busy schedules to listen to one of our greatest public servants on why our work matters and why we need to remain committed to our mission. There is no one that represents public service more than former United States Senator George Mitchell. I asked Senator Mitchell to join us today to speak about the value of our work, and he was very kind to accept the invitation. I first met Senator Mitchell when I was a member of the coaching staff of the Boston Celtics. Senator Mitchell was very good friends with my former boss, Red Auerbach, and he would often join Red in his office for Chinese food uh, prior to uh, uh, Main Day games in Boston. Later I would see Senator Mitchell at the White House when he would come to brief President Clinton on his vitally important work to bring a lasting peace to Northern Ireland. Senator Mitchell has always been my role model for what a great public servant should be. Intelligent, with a tremendous in integrity and commitment to the public good. Senator Mitchell was born in Waterville, the son of immigrants. He graduated from Waterville High School, he earned his bachelor's degree from Bowdoin, and later went on and received his law degree from Georgetown Law School. In high school, he was the sports editor, attended Boy State, and served in the, in the Student Senate. His public career continued as U.S. Attorney and U.S. District Court Judge for Maine. In 1980, he was appointed to the U.S. Senate to complete the term of then Senator and Maine legend, Ed, Edmund Muskie, who resigned to become the Secretary of State. He was elected to full, two full terms in the Senate in 1982 and 1988. From 1989 until 1995, he served, served as the Senate Majority Leader, one of the most important positions in all of Washington. After retiring from the Senate, he went back to practicing law, but that wasn't just enough for Senator Mitchell. He had to do a lot more. He became a member of the board of the Walt Disney Corporation, and I'm not sure if you had a lot to do with the further Mickey Mouse and all the other things. Uh, and then he later became uh, the chairman of the board of the Disney Corporation. While his work in the Senate was extremely important to our nation's history, perhaps his greatest professional accomplishment was as an international diplomat. In, in 1995, President Clinton appointed Senator Mitchell as a special envoy to Northern Ireland, where he negotiated a peace agreement which was signed on Good Friday in 1998. This monumental accomplishment ended a decades-old conflict that cost many lives and divided an entire country. In 2006, again, being the great public servant that he is, Major League Baseball Commissioner Bud Selig asked Senator Mitchell to investigate the widespread use of performance-enhancing drugs by ballplayers. His report was instrumental in baseball's ongoing efforts to curb the use of steroids during play. And then President Obama asked him to serve our nation once again as a special envoy to help bring peace to the Middle East. Senator Mitchell has, been, uh, has received many, many awards but he did receive the highest civilian award any person can receive in our country, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize after negotiating the Northern Ireland Good Friday Peace Agreements. An award, by the way, I truly believe he should have received. Perhaps, though, his proudest accomplishment is founding the Mitchell Institute, 
which awards a scholarship to a Maine high school student, senior from every public high school in the state. As a result, since 1995, they have awarded more than 2,500 scholarships, totaling more than 13 million for Maine students. I'm delighted that Senator Mitchell accepted the invitation to speak to all of us today. His story, story is inspiring to say the least. And it is my hope that all of us will leave here today even more committed to our mission of making sure that Portland continues to be a great place to live, to work, and to play. Senator Mitchell, thank you for being here today. We are honored that you took time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. Colleagues, Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for being here this morning for your very warm reception. Thank you, John, for that uh, overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, I speak often. This is the first of three speeches I'll make today. And so I've heard myself talk so much that for me, the introduction is the highlight of the program. <laughs> And I have to say, John, uh, that was really a very nice introduction. Uh, it's a risky thing, uh, especially for one's mental health, to hear nice things said about you because you may begin to believe them if you hear them often enough. So I like to begin with a story uh, about introductions and an occasion on which I was brought back down to earth. I spent five years uh, working on the peace process in Northern Ireland. And after an agreement was reached, I returned uh, to Maine and I wrote a book about my experience in Northern Ireland. When the book was published, I traveled around the United States to events uh, promoting sales of the book, speaking to various groups. I received many invitations, and in the process, I learned the interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> and just about every one of them invited me to come. I couldn't go to all, but I went to many, and as I traveled the country, uh, speaking to these Irish American groups, there developed among them an informal competition as to who could give the longest uh, most fantastic, uh, frequently quite ridiculous introductions of me. Uh, uh, the proper reaction, of course, would have been for me to show some humility, to ask them to keep it short. Uh, I had an improper reaction. I loved it. <laughs> I encouraged them. Uh, I scolded them when they left something out. Uh, in Chicago, it was a memorable event. A guy got up and he, he spent 30 minutes introducing me, reading a, a long list of everything I'd done in my life, many of which I were not aware until I heard him <laughs> read them off. And when he finished, I scolded him because he left out the fact that uh, in my senior in Waterville High School, I received the science award. <laughs> Well, by the time I got to the last stop, it was in Greenwich, Connecticut, the, uh, the, the uh, Greenwich uh, Irish American Club. My, uh, I was overly impressed with myself, uh, and I had a hard time squeezing my head through the front door, but I did, and uh, uh, the first person I encountered when I got into the room was an elderly woman who rushed up to me, very nervous and excited, shook my hand very hard, and then she said, uh, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three and a half hours just to come here to tell you what a great man I think you are. I'm so grateful for all you've done in the world. She then reeled off a whole bunch of things that I'd done. And uh, she said, and finally to ask you, please, would you autograph my poster? And she handed me a poster with a picture on it and a pen. I looked at it. I said, I'd be very happy to sign your poster, but I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> poster was a big picture of Kissinger. She said, you're not. She said, well, who are you anyway? And when I told her, she said, well, that's just terrible. Uh, she said, I drove three and a half hours to meet a great man uh, named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. 
I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. And she thought for a moment. She said, well, there is. When I asked her what it was, she leaned forward. I leaned forward, very forward touching, and in a very conspiratorial whisper, she said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? So I did. And it's hanging in her living room wall today in Eastern Connecticut, a daily reminder to me that I do bring to mind every day to uh, enjoy but not take too seriously these kind words that John has uh, spoken about me. Well, I want to say uh, to the mayor, to the council, to, the, to John, and to all of the employees of the city of Portland, uh, it's, it's really a great honor for me personally uh, and a great pleasure uh, for me to be here. Uh, I lived uh, uh, in this area for m most of my adult life. Uh, I owned a home in Falmouth, I owned a home in South Portland, I owned a home here in Portland over the course of that time moving around from place to place. Lived in Stroudwater for several years and uh, so I, I regard this really along with Waterville as my true home. I do have a home now in Maine up on uh, Mount Desert Island where my family and I spend summers and holidays. And I like to come back to Maine uh, as much as I can first, of course, because most of my family still lives in Maine and most of my friends are here. But also as a reminder uh, of how fortunate I have been uh, in my life. And I'd like to begin by talking to you not as city employees, but as Americans. Uh, it's inevitable in political campaigns that uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion and a good bit of it is negative. And while we do have serious problems in our country, I believe that the United States remains the most free, the most open, the most just society in all of human history. Imperfect, as are all human beings and all human institutions. But I think the greatness of America lies in our willingness, individually and collectively as a society, to debate, to discuss issues, to acknowledge error where it has existed and there has been much error in our society, and to try to right the wrongs of the past. And if you look at American history, it is really a long and never-ending redefinition of what it means to be a citizen of a free society, of how we perceive individual rights, human rights, and equal rights. And in my judgment, it's been a continual progress. Some steps backward, many misjudgments along the way, many people injured and hurt in the process. We revere our Constitution, and rightly so. The Constitution establishes the principles, along with the Declaration of Independence, upon which our society is based and are largely responsible for the ability of the people of this country to grow and prosper as we have. But the 45 men who gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to write the Constitution, although they were, in a sense, political geniuses, most of them well-educated and visionary. They also were products of the era in which they lived, shaped by the educations and the customs of their society. And so in our Constitution, we specifically condone slavery. The Constitution stated that any African American counted for three-fifths of a vote, less than fully human. It took 75 years 
and the bloodiest war in our history by far, the Civil War, to establish the principle that the right to vote would not be limited to adult white men who own property. It was expanded, at least theoretically, to all members of our society, but not women. It took another half century for the right to vote to be extended to women. It seems incredible to us now, hard to believe that was ever the case, but in fact, it was a long, difficult, and very bitter political struggle for women to achieve the right to vote in our society. True, the true desegregation of our country did not end until more than 100 years after the Civil War. As we as a society condoned, many participated in the erection of legal barriers to those who had ostensibly been freed in the Civil War. Indeed, it was not until 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, that millions of African Americans could, for the first time, enjoy and employ the most basic right in a democratic society, the right to vote. It was not until 1990, when I was Senate Majority Leader, that we enacted the Americans with Disabilities Act, granting to those persons in our society who suffered from disabilities for the first time the right to live fully free, independent, and complete lives, notwithstanding their disability, making them equal in the eyes of the law and of their fellow citizens. And the struggle continues today in terms of gender and other factors. And so while there were many struggles, there was much death and destruction, and there were many people whose lives were shattered. Our society is better today than it ever has been in the past, far more open, far more diverse, far more willing to accept people, each individual, as a human being, worthy of dignity and respect until they prove otherwise. And so I had kids late in life. I have a, two teenage kids. I have an older daughter living in South Portland. But I tell my teenage kids that uh, uh, they should not be deterred or discouraged by all the negative talk and the prospects of the future. I believe that they will lead lives in a better society, in a more open, diverse, freer country than I've had the opportunity to live in. Although I've been very fortunate and I personally believe in the American dream because I've lived it, nonetheless I feel that while our country has progressed in all the respects that I've described, in one important area I feel our country has not made sufficient progress. And that is in meeting the aspiration of opportunity for all of our citizens. My parents were very poor. My mother was an immigrant. She could not read or write. She spent 50 years working the night shift in textile mills. My father was the orphan son of Irish immigrants. He had no education, and he worked as a janitor at Colby College in Waterville. But because of their efforts, because of the openness of American society, and because of many helping hands that I received along the way from people whose only motive was to help this kid get ahead, I was able to get an education and to become the majority leader of the United States Senate. I started my scholarship fund uh, that John mentioned in the introduction after I entered the Senate and traveled around the state and visited every single high school in Maine. I spoke at the graduation of every high school in Maine at least once. It took me about 14 years to do it because they all graduate on just a couple of weekends. And in the course of that, I met thousands and thousands 
of young Maine students. And I saw in many of their eyes and heard in many of their voices the same feelings that I had experienced when I graduated from Waterville High School. Insecurity, uncertainty about the future, lack of self-esteem. And so I started the scholarship program with the goal and the intention of make it possible for every child in Maine, every single one, who has the talent and the willingness to work and wants to go to college but can't do so for financial reasons to be able to do so. I knew then, and I know now, 20 years later, that we won't be able to achieve that goal with mathematical certainty. We won't reach every such child in Maine. But if we commit to it, and we work hard for it every day of our lives, we'll do a lot of good in striving for that goal. And my point is, it's very important to aim high in life. Even if you don't reach the final goal, you'll do a lot of good along the way if the objective is a good one. And I don't think there is anything more fulfilling in life than the opportunity for public service. I served in many public capacities. And I also have been engaged in private business for a long time. And while we all need and want to earn income to support ourselves and our families, I tell the students that I speak to at graduations that uh, uh, they'll want and succeed, many of them, in acquiring wealth. Some of them will acquire fame. And when they do, they'll realize that there's more to life than the acquisition of money, things, and titles. Real fulfillment in life comes, I believe, from engaging in a cause larger than one's self-interest, for serving others, for helping others to achieve the benefits that we ourselves have been fortunate to receive as Americans in our great and free and open society. I thank all of you for the work you're doing in behalf of the people of Portland and this whole area. Although you're employees of Portland, you obviously know that you serve people in a very wide area who come in and out of Portland every day. I recognize that it's a job and you earn income and that is appropriate and necessary. But you're also doing something that has a public good to it. I met several of you who are involved in the parks, several in education, several in public works, and all of you, those and all the others, are engaged in activities that do provide not only good service to people, but an example of what it means to live in a free, open, and democratic society. I hear all the time when I travel around the world, I speak often in Asia and Europe, people concerned about the possibility of the decline of the United States. I tell them that uh, I believe that the United States is in fact and will be for as far into the future as people can see the dominant world power that brings with it benefits, it brings with it responsibilities, just as our being citizens of this society brings with it benefits uh, and responsibilities. And I always like to note to the detractors of the United States as just a tiny example of the extent to which we are the most influential nation. We have 6% of the world's population, and yet nine of the top 10 business brands in the world are American. 15 of the world's top 
20 universities are American. 91% of all online searches and 99% of all smartphones in the world operate on American-made operating systems. It's, uh, those are just tiny, little-known facts, but part of, a, part of a much larger fabric. And I can say to you that uh, people around the world look up to the United States. I spoke in uh, Europe recently, and a fellow got up and <clears throat> made, in the question-answer period, made a statement in the guise of a question which was very hostile to the United States. And he took pleasure in reading to me a recent report that suggested that by the year 2060, China's gross domestic product will be equal to that of the United States. In response, I said to him, well, first, even if that happens, <clears throat> they have four times as many people, which means that on a per capita basis, the United States will still be four times as large as China in gross domestic product. I don't think it's going to happen. But secondly, I asked him this question. <clears throat> I said, one of the greatest problems that we face in the United States is the fact that tens in my judgment, hundreds of millions of people around the world want to come to America. Among the most difficult issues we confront is that of immigration. How do we deal with the fact that so many people want to come here that we can't possibly accept them all? And I asked that man this question. When is the last time you read or heard about anyone risking their life to break into China. Now, China is a great country, a long history, tremendously energetic and entrepreneurial people. And they have done remarkably well at lifting several hundred million people out of poverty and into a growing middle class, something we should applaud and actually benefit from. But the reality is, given their totalitarian form of government, people there want to leave, and there's nobody want to come in. In fact, I did some research on it and found that the only examples I could find of anyone trying to get into China were two men, North Koreans, who broke, broke out of a concentration camp, and the only way out of the country was to swim across the river into China. Those are the only two. Uh, and we have to confront the reality that millions upon millions of people want to come here. I want to say a few, just a few words about that. We are a nation of immigrants. Everybody in America, literally everybody, came from somewhere else, including the Native Americans. They just happened to come 15,000 years earlier when they crossed what is now the Bering Strait, it was then a land bridge into Alaska, and gradually spread over all of North and South America. The Europeans began coming about 500 years ago. And from the very beginning, the British, the Dutch, the French, and the Spanish competed with the Native Americans for control of what we now know as North America. And from the very beginning, there was exclusion, there was demonization of the other, there was hostility, and there was conflict. Everybody here has heard the words Wall Street. What, is, what do they mean? What does it come from? Well, Wall Street is, is a very small street just above the southern tip of Manhattan. And it was where the Dutch first settled and established what they called New Amsterdam. They were worried about hostile neighbors. And so on this small street, they built a wall. And that marked the northern border of their community of New Amsterdam. 
The war was not to keep out the Native Americans, as most people believe. It was to keep out the English, who had settled in what we now call New England, and who threatened to overrun the Dutch, as they ultimately did, and so now it's called New York, not New Amsterdam. And for hundreds, 150 years, the struggle for control of North America occurred, and what is now Maine was a major battleground between the British settlers to the south and the French settlers to the north. After we became a country, we had only, we had less than three million people. Most Americans forget the fact that about a third of the colonists were opposed to the revolution and favored remaining part of the United Kingdom. So actually they had a steep population decline after the United States was created by many of those who left the new country to return to England or to go to what is now Canada or other parts of this hemisphere. And so we needed people. We opened the doors to people from around the world. And for the first 100 years of our existence, anyone could come, and many did, from many parts of the world. The first exclusion of immigrants occurred in 1880, angered by the presence in the United States of many Chinese laborers who had been brought to America to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. The Congress passed a law Nowadays, members of Congress have developed a skill at naming bills in a, with fancy titles that often bear no relationship to what's in the bill. Sometimes it's the very opposite of what's in the bill, but back then they were more blunt. So they passed a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act, pretty direct, and it kept people of Chinese heritage out of the United States. In 1906, San Francisco was devastated by a major earthquake. And the city fathers, the equivalent of these councilors here today, desperate to figure out how to continue educating their children because many of the schools were destroyed, decided to reduce the school population. And so they passed an ordinance that prohibited any child of Japanese ancestry, even those born in the United States, from entering public schools in San Francisco. The Ku Klux Klan is best known for its violent activity toward African Americans in the South in the late 19th century, but it actually reached its peak in America of popularity and acceptance in the 1920s in the North, based not on anti-African rhetoric, but on enormous hostility to Catholics and Jews. And we all know Irish, there are plenty of them here, were the subject of ferocious discrimination in Maine and around the country, and the sign became famous, Irish need not apply, and in Maine papers and magazines and in all across the East, cartoons were published which depicted Irish as subhumans. Every Italian, felt the sting of the demonization of the group that because a few were criminals, mafia members, all of them were deemed criminals and bad. And no one felt the sting of discrimination more than Jews who were excluded from clubs, buildings, all manner of social activity until fairly recently uh, in our society, including right here in Portland. So there's nothing new about this, but the great story is that in every instance, the newcomers coming in got their hands on the bottom rung of the ladder, and they lifted themselves up. And on their shoulders, their children lifted themselves up. Last night I spoke at an event honoring former Governor Brennan, whose parents were Irish immigrants, laborers. And on their shoulders, he lifted himself up 
and became governor of this state, a member of Congress. So hostility, demonization, guilt by association, it's not new. We experienced it throughout our history, but we've always emerged better, stronger, more diverse, and in the end, a more prosperous society. The three most successful business enterprises in the United States and arguably in the world today are Apple, Amazon, and Google. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon was created by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. Google was founded in part by Sergey Brin, who himself was born in Russia. So I ask all Americans and I ask you to think about two rhetorical questions. Would we be a better country if they had not been let in? And secondly, what are the chances that if Steve Jobs had lived his life in Syria, he would have created Apple? Or Jeff Bezos in Havana? Or Sergey Brin in Russia? Genius knows no boundary, no language, no ethnicity. It can exist wherever there are human beings. But history tells us, the history of our great country, that it is more likely to flourish where there is freedom, opportunity for all, equal rights, and equal justice for all. Where people can rise on the basis of their talent, their willingness to work, their willingness to take risk, and create great new enterprises that change the lives of all of the members of society. And they literally have changed our lives. Every person in this room has a cell phone. Every person now engages in a ritual unknown to human beings for, for the thousands of years that human beings have been on this earth. The first thing you do in the morning is you check to see if you got any emails. And the last thing you do at night before you go to bed is to check and see if you got any emails. And I don't want to tell the mayor and the council how many times the staff checks during the day, but there's got to be plenty of them. So I'll conclude this by saying that uh, I'm very grateful to John for having me here. He's a, he's a good friend. I, uh, I met him through Red Auerbach. Red was a very famous coach of the Boston Celtics, uh, one of the most uh, interesting and competitive men I ever met in my life. It didn't surprise me that he was the greatest winning coach of all time because Red had to win at everything that he ever engaged in. I used to play tennis with him, and man, oh man, it was, you'd think we were at Wimbledon or the U.S. Open uh, 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 playing. He fought for every point. He didn't, didn't hit the ball very hard, but he was cagey and wily uh, and a wonderful guy, and we became, uh, we became close friends at the end. And he was really a model of inspiration for me, as I'm sure he was for John and many others. Uh, I wanted to come when John asked me, I was really delighted and pleased to do it, to be able to say these words to you, an expression of gratitude. You probably don't get much, uh, many expressions of gratitude. People complain a lot, uh, that's for sure, when you're in public service. But in the end, I think most people know that uh, uh, the people who engage in the tasks that you do are there both to serve them uh, and to earn income for your families. And I urge you to keep doing what you're doing, to continue to treat the people you deal with, the public, with respect, uh, and to regard every person, however humble they may be, whatever their background may be, with the same degree of respect and warmth and hospitality that you've treated me here today. Thank you all very much. Good luck. Have a great year. Thank you very much, John.
Uh, I, I have a few more minutes, and John has asked if I would take a couple of questions. So if anyone has a question, I'll be happy to try to answer it. If anyone would like to make a speech of your own, I'll be happy to hear that, uh, too. This is your chance to get a microphone here and tell the city councilors a thing or two. Uh, uh, but, but yes, way in the back. Speak up. Jim. Uh, I'll take that as a rhetorical question, like the ones that I ask. <laughs> Anyone else have a question of any kind? Yes, go ahead, Mayor. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, it, it is, of course, uh, a famous statement uh, uh, made by President Reagan in his first inaugural that government is uh, not the solution; government is the problem. Uh, uh, I think even the president would acknowledge that he was making a shorthand suggestion about the failings of government and did not favor the complete abolition of government as the, literal, as the words literally would suggest. Uh, there's much debate in our country uh, about the proper role of government and the limits of government activity. But I think if you look at it, step back and look at it in a broader perspective, you, you would see that uh, the debate is largely on the margins. That is to say, we have understood that uh, there has to be government in order to organize and live in any civilized society. There have to be rules that are accepted by all or most of the people by which people will live. And the reality is that I think of it as two concentric circles, fairly large but close to each other, and the debate is at the margins. People say, well, all government is bad. Well, of course, we know that's literally not true. Uh, there have been many remarkable things, and most of us accept much of government. Red lights are a form of government. Stop signs, lines in the middle of the road. The law that says you have to get a license to perform brain surgery. Uh, you, there, there are literally thousands of aspects of daily life that we accept as the only way people can live in a normal society. And they do restrict individual liberty. I mean, a, a line in the road restricts my right to drive on the left side of the road. Nobody would say, well, we should abolish that. We want complete freedom. So the question really is at the margins. Where, where uh, do the benefits stop and where do the restrictions on individual liberty uh, begin to infringe on our constitutional rights. One Supreme Court justice uh, described it colorfully in these words. He said, my right to swing my arm ends where your nose begins. <laughs> and it made the point effectively that if you want to get the highest possible degree of individual liberty, you must by definition impose some restraints on the individual liberty of every member of society lest it intrude on the liberty of others. Uh, and so my own view is that uh, uh, there have been mistakes made on both sides of the issue. There clearly have been excesses in uh, some degree of government intrusion in activity. There clearly have been areas, as we've learned over time, where government action was necessary. Uh, we have by far the most successful capitalist society in all of human history. And I would argue, some would not agree, that our form of capitalism was greatly enhanced by the enactment of the security exchange laws, which introduced into the system of capitalism requirements of transparency, fairness, uh, tried to eliminate deceit and uh, uh, wrongdoing. And in fact, it's been a great boon, even though it did impose limitations on the extent to which people could act in certain ways. We, we all benefit from uh, uh, some degree of environmental regulation. 
when Senator Muskie first wrote the foundation of our environment laws, the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts, 85% of all of the waters in America were polluted and unfit for human use in any form. Every major river in Maine stunk to the high heavens. When I was a kid, my parents were very poor. We lived literally on the banks of the Kennebec River. You, if you stepped off our back porch, you fell into the river. And it was a slum. It was inhabited entirely by immigrant factory workers who couldn't find any place else to, to live. And the river was covered with scum, smelled to the high heavens, and everyone's goal in life was to move away from the river. Now, it's the opposite. The Kennebec River today is clean, used for human habitation. So there are many areas where collective activity is only possible through government. Just think of the, what has happened in Maine since the turnpike was constructed. Well, no individual has an incentive to build a highway between Portland or between uh, York and Holton. We can only do that collectively through the government, although almost all individuals benefit from that activity. It's been, been a great uh, boon of commerce and uh, increased activity and mobility by our citizens. So, there are some things only government can do. There are some things government should not do. And in between, we have this ongoing political struggle about what is the proper role of government. I'm a Democrat. I believe strongly that there is much that government can do to break down barriers of discrimination, to open doors of opportunity for all, to prohibit types of activity which are unfair and unjust. A hundred years ago, nine-year-old boys worked in coal mines in Pennsylvania. Ten-year-old girls worked in textile mills throughout New England, including here in Maine. We pushed Congress enacted child labor laws which prohibited child labor. And believe it or not, the opponents of the law argued and the Supreme Court of the time agreed that the child labor laws were unconstitutional because they infringed upon the child's right to negotiate with the factory owner. Well, of course, that's all changed now. Nine-year-old boys and 10-year-old girls are in school where they belong. No rational person would today argue that we should abolish the child labor laws so that children can have the freedom to go work in textile mills and coal mines. Prior to the Social Security law, one out of 100 Americans, 1%, had any provision or savings at all for retirement. 99% did not. In my hometown of Waterville, just over the last hill out of town, we had what was called the poor farm. It was a warehouse of death where people on retirement went to live out the last years of their lives in poverty and misery and mostly with a complete loss of self-respect. No rational person today would stand up and say, that's a mistake, let's abolish it. In fact, those who oppose Social Security now proclaim, this is another bit of titling, we want to save it. Well, they want to save it by destroying it, but they don't say we want to destroy it. I mentioned earlier the disabilities, the, the disabilities law, how what a horrific circumstance people uh, lived in with disabilities through most of our nation's history completely lacking in any sense of self-esteem or self-respect. So there's a lot of things that government can do right. No, by, at the end of the Second World War, 4% of Americans had college educations. The breakthrough came when Franklin Roosevelt proposed and Congress enacted the GI Bill of Rights, which said to the millions of American men who'd fought in the war, a grateful nation wants to help you improve in life, and so we're going to help you get a college education. Today, 30% have them. Nobody would argue that's, that was a mistake or a bad thing to do. So it's in the margins. Where is it too much? And there are examples of 
too much or erroneous or mistaken or poorly implemented uh, government action. But on the whole, I think most Americans are practical and pragmatic, accept the reality that we have to have some degree of governance to have the most full expression of freedom and opportunity, uh, and that government can be a force for good where necessary. But we all believe also that it should refrain from acting in those areas where it is not suited to act, and that's another source of controversy. And one of the political problems, Ethan, is that we're all kind of on both sides of the issue. I mean, those who are most opposed to government in the abstract are most in favor of government regulation in the areas that they deem important, like abortion. And I'll, I'll give one example. My very first day in the Senate, first day, I was appointed. I went to a hearing on a committee that was just me and the chairman. It was on the banking committee. And the first witness was a representative of the American Bankers Association. There were two bills under consideration. He testified uh, in opposition to the bill. And he gave a very emotional, pretty standard statement of the evils of government and how we don't want more federal government activity. And uh, it's kind of a sort of a prelude to what Reagan later said. And we went to the second bill. The second bill provided that the federal government enact a national usury law. That is, the gov federal government take over the subject of interest rates, which had previously been entirely a state-controlled issue. And the American Bankers Association, this guy took a strong position in favor of that legislation. So when he finished, I said, I, I said to him, well, I said, you know, you, you read, made this statement on the first bill, now you made this statement. I said, these are directly contradictory. I said, do, do you understand that? Oh, yes, he said, I understand that. I said, well, what's your explanation? He said, well, the first bill was theory. This is reality. <laughs> so our positions, all of us, are judged based on self-interest and what we think is important and we are for or against government action depending upon what we perceive to be its effect on us. Overall, I think that we've achieved a relative equilibrium in our society and that the debate is on the margins and will continue to be, has been for the very beginning of our country. Uh, uh, Lincoln, the first American president, was the most aggressive exponent of big government that you could have. Uh, he, he's, <laughs> He not only forced the South to stay in the country, uh, he built the railroads, he established the college land grant system. Thomas Jefferson spent most of his life writing against the evils of government and especially too much executive power in one person. And then when he got to be president, he had a chance to make the Louisiana Purchase to buy what is all now the Western United States from France, from, from Napoleon, for seven million dollars, and he ignored Congress, he ignored everything he'd previously said about the subject, he reversed himself, and he made the Louisiana Purchase. Who's to say he was wrong? It, it's a circumstance dependent on how you feel and what you believe, uh, and I think it's kind of a healthy thing for our society that the debate continues, hopefully, uh, within the bounds of uh, reason and uh, civil discourse. Thank you all very much. Great to be here. Yeah.